Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call the meeting of the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District Board of Trustees to order for August 18th, 2022. Ask the secretary, please call the roll. Ms. Chambers. Here. Mayor Alai. Here. President Brown. Here. Mr. Sewer. Here. Mayor DeGita, present. Mayor Bocci. Present. Ms. Dukes. Here. Thank you very much. And now I ask for the approval of the minutes from our August 4, 2022 meeting. So moved. Motion by Mayor Bachi. Second. Second by Ms. Chambers. Is there a question? If there's no question. The minutes will stand approved as they are printed. Now I ask Madam CEO if anyone has signed up to speak during the public session portion of our agenda on a specific agenda topic. They have not, Mr. President. And then we will have your report, please. Thank you, President Brown and members of the board. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Beginning with COVID-19, we have no active cases among district employees with three district employees with COVID-like symptoms. So we remain at 225 confirmed cases since the beginning of the pandemic with all of those folks recovered and returned to work. As you know, President Biden signed the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 this week. While not focused on water, this bill includes initiatives with the potential investment in communities uh, in clean water to address issues like climate change, environmental justice, and clean energy. So just a couple of the funding highlights that are in this new legislation. There's $1.9 billion for the Department of Transportation to support efforts to improve affordable transportation, and this does include stormwater management in disadvantaged communities. There's also $3 billion to EPA's environmental and climate justice block grants to help disadvantaged communities with activities related to climate resiliency and adaptation. And there's $837 million for HUD to support water and energy efficiency improvements in affordable housing. So we will continue to track this as it rolls out, but as we have discussed earlier and we'll see later on the agenda, our focus continues to be the money for clean water that's in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. So the Ohio Water Environment Association held their annual technical conference July 25th through the 28th in Cleveland, and the district received several awards. So our sewer system maintenance and operation department received two collection system safety awards. And these include the collection safety award for organizations with more than 20 employees working in the collection system and the collection system of the year award from OWEA. And then environmental services also received a safety certificate in recognition of their good work. And specifically, the criteria for these safety awards includes providing proper training, OSHA reportable accidents and injuries, conducting safety meetings, doing accident uh, prevention and investigations, emergency action plans, lockout tagout, and confined space training. So great work to the teams for those awards. And then also each year the OWEA awards the 5S award to individuals across the state. Now I'll say this very slowly, 5S is the Select Society of Sanitary Sludge Shovelers. The award is given to honor individuals who have made notable contributions to the wastewater industry and it dates back to the mid 1980s and there's over 200 folks who have been uh, recognized with this award. And now this includes our own Frank Greenland as the fifth district individual to receive the 5S award. So thank you, congratulations to Frank. Shoveling for a long time. <laughs> that's my life. <laughs> so that's wonderful recognition uh, for Frank and for the for the team. And it was great to have this conference for a long time. in Cleveland. <laughs> So we have also been awarded with the 27th Annual Achievement of Excellence in Procurement for 2022 from the National Procurement Institute. As you know, this award is earned by public and nonprofit agencies that demonstrate a commitment to procurement excellence. We're one of five state agencies that have received this award, and we have received this award every year since 2015 except for the very weird year of 2017 when somehow Jackie Williams did not uh, oh. receive this award. <laughs> We're naming names. 
<laughs> but this is a this is a wonderful recognition of the very hard work that uh, Jackie leads, and also with Ken's support in the finance team. And and I want to acknowledge that great work and the consistency of the work. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. <laughs> I'm also excited to share that the district earned recognition for its graphic design on three projects from Graphic Design USA, which is an international resource for graphic design professionals. Our awarded projects included our 2022 employee calendar celebration for our 50th anniversary year, one of our six 50th anniversary seals, which was, were also among the winners, and then our 2021 employee newsletter announcing the refreshed logo and the rebranding. So congratulations to the great work on this as well. And then we'll close with some great employee and facility photos as we recap our 2022 plant tours. So this was a new initiative to get folks that work in the district out and about in the district. And in May, June, and July, 56 employees toured Easterly, the Scioto Green Infrastructure Basin in East Cleveland. This is actually the Fleet Avenue Green Infrastructure Basin in Slavic Village and then the Watershed Stewardship Center at West Creek in Parma. So folks gave great feedback. They really appreciated the opportunity to see our stormwater management work and our wastewater treatment work and how important it is to meet their fellow employees and to see parts of the operation that they had not seen before. And I think, Ms. Chambers, you were on one of the tours as well. Absolutely, yes. So thank Beautiful. you. Thank you for joining us. So President Brown, that's our report. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Madam CEO, any questions? If not, we will move to our action items. Uh, congratulations on all the awards and the fine work and recognition from the state. Uh, let's start with <clears throat> authorization to advertise. Authorization to publish notice calling for bids in accordance with a high votes revised code section 6119.10 for the Chippewa Creek Bank stabilization at Route 21 and Brexville project anticipated expenditure of $2,246,500. Make that motion, Mr. President. Motion by Mayor Bacci. Second. Second by Ms. Chambers. Is there a question? There's no question without objection. It's approved. Resolution 264-22. Thank you very much. Let's go authorization to enter into agreement. Uh, this is a request for authorization to enter into a project agreement with the Board of Park Commissioners, the Cleveland Metropolitan Park District to provide local match funding toward the Cleveland Metro Parks Foster's Run Stream Restoration Project in an amount not to exceed $40,000 combined with $500,000 from the Board of Park Commissioners of the Cleveland Metropolitan Park District to be paid from H2 Ohio project grant funds toward the total project cost of $540,000. Move to adopt. Motion by Mr. Sulik. Second. Second by Mr. Loomis. Is there a question? There's no question without objection. It's approved. Resolution 265-22. Thank you. Let's go to <coughs> authorization to enter into contract. This is authorization to enter into a three-year contract with Centus Corporation for Uniform Services at all district facilities through Omnia Partners Cooperative Purchasing Program in an amount not to exceed $563,358.90. Motion to approve. Motion by Ms. Chambers. Second. Second by Mayor Ally. Question? There's no question without objection. It's approved. Resolution 266-22. Thank you. Uh, let's go authorization to amend agreement. This is authorization to amend professional services agreement number 17006784 with Stantec Consulting Services, Inc. For the Stormwater General Engineering Services II project to include additional work scope for the construction, administration, slash resident engineering, and closeout services necessary for the Upper Ridgewood Basin Improvement Project and to increase the agreement amount by $123,638, thereby bringing the total agreement amount not to exceed $1,873,638. Motion to approve. Second. Second by Mr. Loomis. Second. 
Move to adopt 267-22. Second. second. Second by Mayor Bocci. Is there a question? There's no question without objection. It's approved. Resolution 267-22. Okay. Uh, let's try authorization to amend policy. <coughs> this is authorization to amend the district's debt management policy originally adopted in resolution number 6107 and amended in resolution 295-10 to include various changes, including the incorporation of a revised interest rate swap policy, all as presented. Move to adopt. Motion by Mr. Sulik. Second. Second by Ms. Dumas. <clears throat> question. Of course, there's a question. These, uh, this is kind of a major rewrite, a yes, si yes. significant rewrite of these policies, et cetera. So uh, I would think some explanation, overview might be appropriate. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, President Brown, members of the board. Um, as you pointed out, it's uh, looking at the red line of this policy. It is a significant rewrite to the text. I mean, the core concepts and principles are the same. Okay. Um, the original debt management policy was uh, created in 2007, last edited in 2010. You know, that was a very different time for us from a financial perspective. Uh, we were entering the consent decree, anticipating essentially a, a every other year bond issuances going forward at that point. Um, a lot has changed since then, so this rewrite um, incorporates some of the current uh, factors in play now, the changes in the WPCLF loan program that we've taken advantage of, and really reflects where we are now and going forward. Uh, we worked with our uh, financial advisors from Baker Tilly Muni Municipal Advisors to revise these policies mm -hmm. and combine the in existing interest rate swap policy into one comprehensive debt management policy. So I'll briefly talk about what stayed the same so um, from the previous policy, obviously the board has uh, approval authority over all of our debt transactions. Um, we continue to focus on the, 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 the best, lowest cost, long-term options as we look to finance our capital program, have the best uh, long-term impact on rates. Um, the wastewater priority of funding uh, does remain the same, obviously grant funding loan, uh, loan low, low interest loan funding and um, cash when available are the priorities, bonds are, and um, other financing uh, alternatives are less favorable, more costly. Mm -hmm. um, we're not changing the board coverage policies. So these are the debt coverage policies that we under no circumstances should go under. These are higher than our trust agreement policies. Uh, but lower than the CFO policies that we use for long-term financial planning. So these are the floors by which we will never go under. Um, the savings thresholds for refunding transactions uh, stays the same at 4%. Um, and while there was a significant rewrite and uh, update to the uh, interest rate swap portion of the policy, we continue to um, move with extreme caution and have no interest at this point in pursuing any derivative transactions. Um, so what's changed? Some general updates, uh, refreshes, according, refreshers according to GFOA best practices. Uh, we, we codified our sort of standing policy to not issue debt for the stormwater program at this point. Um, the capital uh, load on the sewer side with the consent decree is significant. We have $2 billion outstanding. Um, at this point, we don't want to issue new debt for stormwater, given the ongoing capital needs on the sewer side. We extended the maximum borrowing length to 40 years in our policy. It had previously been 30. As you know, we did um, a 40-year structured loan uh, with the Shoreline Tunnel earlier this year. We also had done some 35-year bonds in the past, so we just wanted to be able to have the policy reflect the furthest we could go by Ohio Revised Code. Okay. Um, and as I mentioned, we combined the uh, swap policy into the debt management policy document. So with that, I'll be glad to answer any other questions. Any questions? Mr. Chair, it, it really read as though you were being tremendously specific about each step that happens during the process as opposed to changing the policy and up, upgrading it for GFOA and Ohio Revised Code 
there weren't significant changes other than you wanted clarity on each step and who's responsible for what. So it didn't seem. Yes, that was our goal, Ms. Dumas. <clears throat> there are no other questions, and without objection, it's approved. Resolution 268-22. <laughs> Drum roll. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> Let's go. Authorization for bond defeasance. Partner. Okay. Providing for the defeasance of a portion of Series 2014 bonds maturing November 15, 2049, and a portion of the Series 2020 bonds maturing November 15, 2049, an amount not to exceed $90 million previously issued for the purpose of acquiring, constructing, and improving water resource projects, and for refunding obligations previously issued for that purpose authorizing the execution of an escrow agreement for the purpose of effecting the defeasance of the defeased bonds and authorizing such other actions as are necessary and appropriate to accomplish the transactions hereby authorized. Move to adopt 69-22. Motion by Ms. Second. Dumas, second by Mayor Bachi. Question, just if you could, I, I, I read it, I read, read some, I'm trying to Thank us. You just told us what the threshold was for uh, uh, for debt service service earnings, uh, and this is like, and this is projected to be in excess of four percent, which is that threshold. Uh, so, if you could just uh, just explain that a little bit, and then if you can quantify what that means to us in dollars and over what period of time. Yes, absolutely, President Brown. Um, first, I'll just uh, take one step back and uh, walk through our um, financial plan that we've been implementing over the last year and sort of where this transaction fits in relation to some of the other large transactions that we've done recently. Um, going back to uh, early last year as we were starting to wrap up the RAISE study, we began working with Baker Tilly, our financial advisor, to look at uh, funding mixes, capital financing opportunities, as well as ways to best utilize the cash that we have available coming out of the rate study. Um, so we reviewed all those obligations, looked forward, and we came up with basically a three-pronged plan of finance. It started with the 2021 bond refunding, where we specifically left behind uh, some large maturities of the 2014 bonds to potentially defease in the future as the most uh, most ripe in terms of financial savings for that type of activity. We then went forward and took our last two large loans for the foreseeable future, WPCLF loans for the Shoreline Storage Tunnel and Westerly Chemically Enhanced High Rate Treatment. Both of those loans are uh, under 2% in terms of their interest rates over the long term. And then in December of last year, we made our first uh, move into the defeasance activity with a, a one maturity of the 2014 bonds. This is the next step in this process to take out those remaining 2014 bonds, as well as a few additional 2020 bonds based on where we stand today. So this transaction specifically, we're looking at, as I mentioned, two maturities of the 2014 bonds. Those have a 4% interest rate on them, and a two maturities of the 2020 bonds with a 3.3% interest rate. As you can see, these are very uh, long maturities. Um, we're estimated to need about $87 million in cash to defease those, um, but that is going to generate about $79.5 million in savings, or 94% um, of, def of the defeased par. Um, on a year-by-year -year basis, we're looking at uh, debt service savings of about $3.1 million. Um, obviously, that debt service reduction has that ongoing impact on debt service coverage, taking pressure off of the total debt service, which is really the driver in the rates. So this transaction, combined with all those others, gives us the best opportunity to have the most impact on rates going forward. This is just a brief look at, in terms of our outstanding debt, what that looks like. Um, as you can see, there's small slices at the top, but the blue and the green slices represent the debt service associated with the bonds that we are going to defease. The, uh, the larger blocks at the end are those actual, when those principal payments would have been due. 
Um, and moving forward, John, uh, this is that chart without those debt. So we still have that opportunity to utilize debt capacity in those future years on some of these large projects coming up, such as the, uh, the Southerly Tunnel within a, in a few years, um, without having a, such a significant impact on the near-term rates. All right, very good. Uh, that's a great bottom line that you got to, so it uh, looks like a significant opportunity for us uh, and our ratepayers. So thank you for uh, due diligence in that regard. Any other question or concern? Uh, if there's no other question or concern without objection, it's approved. Resolution 269-22. Thank you very much. Go property related transaction. This is an authorization to acquire one permanent stormwater easement at the property known as permanent parcel number 4572006, located on East Linden Lane, the city of Parma, owned by West Creek Conservancy, necessary for the ongoing maintenance of floodplain along Baldwin Creek. Total consideration of $1. Move for adoption of Resolution 270-22. Motion by Mayor Lai. Second. Second by Ms. Chambers. Is there a question? A quick comment. Yes, sir. We just talked about saving a lot of money. This is a 50% reduction over the August uh, 4th meeting in property-related transactions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can't get anything by you, Karen. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, no other question or comment without objection. That it's approved. Thank you. Resolution 270-22. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let's go. Hearing officer findings and recommendations. Uh, let's start with adopting the findings of recommendations of the hearing officer regarding sewer count of Robert Buckwald. Uh, sewer district hearing number 21-002. That no further adjustments be made. Request adopting the findings and recommendations of hearing officer regarding sewer count of BP Corporate Properties LLC, sewer district hearing number 21-013, that no further adjustments be made, and then finally request for adopting the findings and recommendations of the hearing officer regarding sewer count of Lori <coughs> Obney, sewer district hearing number 20-016, that no further adjustments be made. Motion to approve. Motion by Ms. Chambers. Second. Second by Ms. Dumas. Is there a question? Being none without objection, they are approved. Resolutions 271 through 273-22. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to finally authorization to assist member communities. Uh, this is authorization to assist member communities in nominating projects to a how EPA uh, for Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act funding as presented and authorization to enter into project <coughs> agreements with those member communities sec selected by OEPA to receive IIJA funding to allow one or more district engineering consulting firms to perform design services for such projects with no cost to the district. Move to adopt. Motion by Mr. Sulik. Second. Second by Mayor Bachi. Question, uh, well, I do have a question. Um, I was reading the description here and it, it, it made reference to the uh, statement basically to provide assistance and support. So just trying to understand what does that mean? Uh, I, I see that we're managing design, but what else does that, <coughs> does that in, incorporate and how does that apply to what we've already done to this point? Devonna Marshall will kick off with that, President Brown. President Brown, members of the board, um, first and foremost, we are assisting the communities in um, developing and submitting the applications. So we're utilizing a lot of the information that we have gathered through the local sewer system evaluation studies to put those applications together. So that's the first step. <clears throat> if we're successful in um, receiving any of that money, money to your point, President Brown, the next step would be for us to then manage the procurement and the design contracts that would be required to deliver those projects. Okay. Uh, 
um, what else? So, and, and then I also read with interest, it says that uh, this would uh, allow us also to use one or more of the district engineering consulting firms for the purposes of design services here. Um, and kind of understanding our relationship with some of our member communities, particularly the ones that are eligible in this regard, a number of them uh, either have their own uh, staff or some of them have uh, their own consultant that are, acts as their city engineer. Uh, and so wh what happens in those instances? Are they uh, just out of luck with respect to that or is there a way for their a consultant to qualify, get approval, how, do, how are we going to approach that? So President Brown, that's actually a very good question. So um, I'll answer it in many ways because it all depends on how much money we get, right, and um, how much funding we get for how many projects because first and foremost we want to be very efficient to how we deliver these projects so ideally we'll be able to package them all into one design and then also deliver them in one construction project. Um, in the future in the hopes that if we're successful in getting money for the design portion, we can go back in future years and hopefully get funding for the construction portion. Um, but with that said, it also depends on the amount of funding we get and the number of projects um, because we have a lot of um, different options in front of us on how we would deliver those projects. Um, so if it's not a lot of money, if we only get a small portion of the $8 million, there's probably a good chance that we would utilize existing contracts like our general engineering services. Um, but that's not, I mean, we can also consider going out for um, a request for a proposal where we would probably look to encourage those local consulting firms who do more city work to um, put in um, proposals on the design aspects. Well, that, that would, that's interesting, and I, I, I think that's a, a Good, res good response, fair response, because I, I got to believe uh, this is, a, uh, as we all understand, just the beginning of this program process, uh, and it can become, uh, both from the design and construction side of it, um, it, it can in have a, a lot of uh, cash infused into it, so it might be very good for the local economy of uh, consultants and then engineers in the region and the area so I just wanted to make sure that we were cognizant of that opportunity as well so all right all right there's no other question what's my objection it's approved resolution 274-22 thank you that does complete our action items Go to information item. We have program management status report and update for July 2022. Good afternoon, President Brown, members of the board. Good afternoon. So this is the monthly update on the capital improvement program for July 2022. So I will point out this is the first time in a long time that as part of this presentation, we're going to have a monthly feature. I personally am very happy about that. <laughs> um, because also of note, because we're having the monthly feature, I will not be providing construction updates. Um, but in your board packet, I, we do include our monthly brochure where we highlight some of the ongoing active um, construction efforts. Okay. Um, the monthly feature will be on the Westerly Chemically Enhanced High Rate Treatment Construction. Um, and that, will be, that update will be provided by Robin Roop. She's the um, district project manager on that project. Okay. So looking first at cash flow, we ended the month of July at 78% of plan. This is also where we ended the month of June. In regards to actual dollars paid out, we paid out um, $15 million in the month of July. And year to date, we're tracking about $108.4 million. Moving on to our key performance indicators um, on the design side, we completed the design of the Eastley Tundered Water and Pump Station Groundwater Drainage Cleaning and Repairs Project. The estimated construction is 800000 on that project, and that was completed within 60 days of plan meeting the KPI. On the construction side of things, we, we achieved substantial completion on the Sudley second stage settling improvements. That um, construction contract is a $38.4 million contract, and we did achieve that within 90 days of plan meeting the KPI. Um, also in construction, we closed the construction contract for the district-wide HVAC equipment and systems upgrade, the final dollar amount of that contract was $4.5 million. That was a construction-only contract, 
and that was within 95% of the original contract amount meeting the KPI there. Um, however, we did not meet our KPI in the business opportunity program goal on this project. The district goals were set at 15% MBE WBE and 5% SBE, where the projected actual is 2.1% MBE WBE and 94.5% um, for SBE. So the reasoning there is unfortunately the MBE WBE firm that was um, slated to perform work on this job could not meet its commitments of the subcontract due to COVID related issues. Um, but on the bright side, that work did go to an, um, an SBE firm bumping up that percentage to the 94.55%. Looking at the work orders um, by change categories of a percent of construction on that job, they came in at just over 4% at 4.08%, which equates to about $182,000. And as you can see from the graphic there, <clears throat> the majority of that fell to the category of owner requested changes. And then also, and finally, we um, completed the construction of, or closed the construction, I'm sorry, for the Southerly Miscellaneous Disinfection and Solids Handling Improvements. This was a design build contract where the final dollar amount came in at 4.25 million. And this was within 95% of that original contract amount meeting the KPI. And we did meet the KPI in this project for the business opportunity program goals. Again, the district goals were set at 15% MBE WBE and 5% SBE, where the projected actual are 29.89% MBE WBE and 5.48% SBE. And then again, looking at the total work orders by change categories on this project, those equated to 3.35%, which is approximately $141,000. And again, the majority of that fell to the category of owner requested changes. And with that, I'll take any questions you have on my portion of the presentation. Questions? No. No. All right. So, that, that's again, good. Robin Roop is going to give you an update on the Westerly Chemically Enhanced High Rate Treatment um, Project. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, Mr. President, members of the board. Good afternoon. I'm here to give you an update on our Westerly Chemically Enhanced High Rate Treatment Project. So, some of the Objectives that we were looking towards uh, setting when we designed this project were to maintain treatment with both chemically enhanced primary treatment, also with high rate treatment for the disinfection, and that's for up to 411 million gallons. Currently, the facility that we have is sized for 300, so this is going to be an increase in capacity. Uh, we're also trying to avoid any negative impacts to the infamous CSO 69 activation. This is the Edgewater Beach location where we currently have uh, been working on improvements to our collection system to provide a level of service for 10-year storm events. I'm going to give you some of the main impacts that we've looked at on this project to Whiskey Island Drive and some closures that we'll have there, a new entrance that we're going to be building at the plant, some temporary reduction in our wet weather treatment at the plant, relocating our employee parking, as well as I mentioned, some impacts to CSO 069. This project did get underway in April of this year and will be going on through September of 2026. So some history for the Sistoff facility is what we currently refer to this location as. Uh, we dated back the original tanks at the facility um, into the 1930s Although the plant was built in, in the early 1910s decades, um, we found about 1930s is when they built the original Imhoff tanks. You can see a picture of what those tanks look like there in the middle. And that same space, that same footprint in the late 1970s, early 80s, we converted those tanks to what we know as the Sistoff tanks today. And you can see a picture of that shown there on the right. So part of the improvements, we're going to be touching not only existing facilities of Sistoff, which you see in those buildings 6, 7, and 1, but we're also going to be touching various locations as well throughout the plant and then building some new facilities, which you see there in the blue, taking us right up to the property line of our already very tight postage stamp property uh, we have out at Westerly. This image is given to show you guys what the uh, 3D version of the new facility will look like. So everything that's there in that dashed yellow line, that's going to be our new facility. Uh, we're adding some additional settling tanks here in the middle, some new disinfection tanks here, 
and then also providing um, a control building where we'll have some additional electrical equipment, uh, chemical feed system, so forth. And I'll get to our effluent flow conduit and flow control chamber um, as well in our next slide. Uh, but that's also being provided as some of the new enhancements on this facility. With the main goals of trying to meet our consent decree as well as protect the plant and the lake uh, during wet weather events, we gave some serious consideration to how could we capture the flow, the 411 million gallons that are required by our consent decree to provide treatment, but also maintain additional flow paths for the flow to travel and safeguard, like I said, the plant um, during wet weather events. So we had three different options of where flows will be controlled. They'll be using the existing syst-off tanks, the new settling tanks and disinfection tanks. That will be the capacity for our 411 million gallons. Once we get above that flow, we have a bypass pipe, we're calling it the effluent flow conduit, that we're being installed around the new facility, as well as the control chamber. That will allow us to help control that 411 million gallons, as well as to send another 480 million gallons around the facility. And then in extreme events, when we get above about 900 million gallons, we will still have use of that center channel, which is what we currently use um, when we can't handle the flows in the existing tanks. Uh, we'll have the capacity for about 600 more million gallons, allowing us about 1.5 billion gallons worth of capacity that we'll be able to handle with this facility. During the first phase of construction, which an idea of time frame that's about April of this year till about June of next year, we're trying to really set the stage and get the plant ready for the major improvements in excavation that are about to occur. So for this, some highlights of things that we're doing, we're going to actually relocate our existing entrance. So currently our entrance comes through in this location here. We're going to be moving security to the bottom of the um, existing admin building, so on that first floor there. So this will now then become our new plant entrance. This will save us from some of the headaches that we could have in the areas that we need in this area for the excavation and the amount of trucks we'll have coming in and out. Our contractors had to park now off-site because we, as I said, obviously don't have a lot of space for them. So our trailers are all going to be located in this area just to the west of the property and we're providing a turnstile for them to access so they don't have to walk down Whiskey Island Drive to get into the plant. Our employee parking is moving up to by our maintenance building as they currently park down in this area where the tanks are going to be. And we also have now a temporary easement with the Port of Cleveland where we'll be moving some of their existing trailers away from the fence line and using some of that property to store equipment for lay down as well as for the construction needed to uh, actually install the tanks and then this bypass, uh, the effluent flow conduit. So I mentioned the changes that are going to occur to the entrance. So this is currently the entrance into the plant through here. We are going to provide an entrance there when the project is set and done. Um, it will not be our primary means of entrance. That will be still where we currently are relocating uh, to the admin building. But we will have that ability with a swipe card system and an intercom system. So should truck deliveries be easier to get in and out of that location um, or employees can swipe in and so forth and security will have cameras that they can see exactly who they're speaking to on the intercom as well. Um, but we are going to, like I said, put in new gate system and swipe cards and so forth, all in this location here by admin for our main plant entrance. So to give you some orientation, this is Whiskey Island Drive. It was, we're heading out to Wendy Park. And in this is where the existing Northwest Interceptor is located. This is what brings the flow into the existing Sistoff facility. We're going to be making a connection into that existing pipeline to put in our new effluent flow conduit. And as you can see, that takes up some of the room within Whiskey Island Drive. So in order to make this installation, we have, during the month of November, to have one lane of closure. We provided the contractor some restrictions where they could mobilize, they could get set up to what will be a full closure in the months of December and January, where they will take full advantage of having that road to install the portion of the conduit that's located in the road. Then coming back in February and in March, they'll reopen to one lane where they'll complete the excavation of this area and restore the work 
so that by the time boating and recreation season starts into the end of March and into April, they'll have full access again um, for all the boating and recreation that occurs out at Wendy Park. But obviously that means we still have to provide a way for the traffic to get out to Wendy Park on a limited basis, as well as to the marinas and emergency vehicles, the Port Authority, so forth. We've worked with a contractor as well as our security staff that will be providing access badges to a restricted list of individuals who will gain access through our plant along this marked route. It'll be identified um, on the ground as well as we'll have a flagger from the contractor during the days to help the staff <coughs> meander their way through our facility. By no means is this intended for uh, boaters to bring their boats out through the plant, but you know, we're really trying to restrict this just to the uh, necessity of folks in the area. We've also worked with the City of Cleveland in regards to their emergency vehicles. And once the new entrance is set, we're going to uh, have them out actually to test uh, with the fire and EMS equipment to make sure they're comfortable too getting in and out of the this facility uh, during these restricted months. During the second phase of construction, so I want to compare this similar to what we did over at Easterly where we put in our new tanks for the SE, the Easterly Secondary System Improvements. So those are large tanks, big excavation pit, where we're doing something very similar here <clears throat> at Westerly, we need to make those tanks butt up directly against the existing line of our existing SISTA facility. So for to do that, that means we need to shut down this facility at some point and no longer send flow through our center channel or through our tanks. In addition, we have modifications that have to be made in the existing tanks and the existing degrit and dewatering building. So all through that time, we have worked with a contractor to gain a reduced yet full shutdown of this facility. So what does that mean? We have stormwater that's still coming to the facility as well as um, from our CSOs that has to go somewhere. And what we did was try to give serious consideration to not impacting CSO 69 any further than we could. Well, for the 10-year event, unfortunately, which is what we've been shooting towards, we were not able to provide, because we don't have our facility any longer uh, during those months, that same level of protection, but we did ensure that during what we call our typical year that we generally use for um, a lot of our design requirements, our, during our typical year, we will be able to provide at least some protection so we won't be overflowing at least at 069 during those typical year storm events. This construction will take us through August of 2025. Also during that time period, I wanted to mention that there is a water line that is located um, under the uh, new Metro Parks trail that we are working with both the Metro Parks and Cleveland Water to relocate. Uh, so we will have some closures along Whiskey Island Drive again. I will mention though, we've worked again with the contractor and the local uh, entities to make sure this is done at night and during the winter months so that we're not impacting, or I should say as little as possible, impacting the businesses in that area. And then our third phase is the commissioning phase. So this is gonna take us out into 2025 and 2026 We'll make some chemical improvements to provide for the disinfection as well as other feeds of chemical in the system. And then we'll work on our commissioning and our startup and that will be taking us out to that 2026 timeframe. We have, as I mentioned several times during the presentation, a lot of coordination with our outside entities, making sure not only can they get through the plant during the construction period, but also making sure that we're abiding by some of the concerns with noise any restrictions on traffic, so coming in and out with, with truck traffic. This is being a blind curve here by the plant. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that we got buy-in um, from the councilwoman in that area and any concerns that she may have on notifying the public and making sure that they're aware. We put up several signs at the location too um, to let everybody know what, what the project is and what we're hoping to accomplish. So to reiterate, as I had previously indicated, these are some of the main impacts. As we discussed, the Whiskey Island Drive closure, the new entrance we'll be providing to the plants, the temporary reduction in the wet weather treatment, our relocation of our employee parking lot, the impacts to CSO 069. And here, as I mentioned too, are the timeframes in which we'll have both partial completion of using SISTOF and the new CHRT facility, as well as then the full shutdown, which will occur starting next fall of 2024 into 2025. With that, I'll take any questions you may have. Uh, 
not really a question, but just uh, just looking at uh, kind of the, the geography of that site. It, you mentioned Easterly. It's, it's a whole different animal from it than Easterly. This is, you know, trying to squeeze 10 pounds or something in a fine pot bag. <laughs> <laughs> this is really trying to optimize a site that really and it's, it's surrounded by a, a number of important neighbors. I mean, you got you, you got a water system plant, right? Almost right next door. You got yacht clubs. You got everything, in, and then and all the all the flow that comes from the Northwest Interceptor, which is one of my favorites. Um, and just looking at the opportunity to do have the same impact you had on the east side, which I guess is the optimum goal here. Uh, so that we don't have the amount of uh, not necessary basement flooding, but discharge to the environment that we've had historically. So uh, I think between that and your schedule and your ability to make sure that you stay on schedule uh, so that you don't impact these other uh, entities, some of them which have seasonal programs, is a huge challenge. So. I mean, good plan, but oh boy, it's good. <laughs> good we'll do our best. As yes, we'll do our best, obviously, to try to implement all of this time frame allotted. And I just wanted to comment that on on that, President Brown. First of all, I wish I had that speech when we were negotiating with the consent decree, but but it, it sounded very similar to to the same story we were telling them. It, it, this is not, you know, we're environmentalists too, and we we do our job and we do it well, and this is not. A small undertaking. Mm. We often downplay mm. our projects, mm. but we do some pretty sophisticated construction <clears throat> and design, and this is one of them. Um, and we have our best team on it, and we have a good contractor, and we're hopeful it'll go well. But um, there's a lot we're dealing with here. Not only the small footprint, um, but obviously we're close to the water, so you we're going to have water issues with excavation. And yeah, it's not going to be an easy job, but we're hopeful it'll go on with, with success and not any major complications. Okay. I'm going to take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I stay tuned. All right. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great presentation. I appreciate it. All right. That takes care of our information item. Let's move to open session. Uh, anything for the good of the order? Nope. nope. Um, Madam CEO, has anyone signed up to speak during the public session portion of our agenda on any subject matter? They have not, Mr. President. Okay. And I do not believe we have a matter for executive session today. No, sir. Oh. We do not. Oh. Okay. Then I, we have completed our agenda, and I will entertain a motion to adjourn. And I'll make that motion, Mr. President. A motion by second. Mayor Bocci, second by Ms. Dumas. Without objection, we're adjourned. Thank you.